Good evening, everybody. If everybody could grab a seat, we'll get started. Welcome uh, to Matter. Uh, my name is Arun Bhatia, Senior Program Director here uh, at Matter. Uh, how many of you folks have not been here before? Oh, okay, just a few. Well, good. Uh, the, the rest of you will have to suffer through my spiel. Uh, for just a minute, uh, but welcome. We're really excited to have all of you uh, here today. Uh, as many of you know, Matter, which has been around uh, for a little over three years now, uh, supports uh, roughly 220 startup companies uh, in the space, along with our 70 industry partners. And those 220 primarily are in the digital health, health IT space. Uh, and one of the areas that we've been very interested in expanding is the life science base. Uh, and so when we had an opportunity to uh, do a program in that space, learn a little bit more about some of the technology, the cutting edge technology that's happening in that space, uh, we were very excited to have the opportunity to host uh, Sangamo Therapeutics here uh, tonight and Dr. Sandy McRae, uh, their CEO. Um, I remember back when I was in grad school in 2000 when the human genome was first uh, being sequenced and being read, uh, it was just exciting to understand, uh, boy, there's a swath of information that we can learn uh, from, from this sequencing and from this new amount of data. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's been amazing to see, you know, fast forward 18, 19 years now, uh, what folks are actually doing with this data and how they're implementing it and how they're actually translating it. Uh, and so one of the things that we really focus on here at Matter is how are we helping our companies translate their technologies and commercialize them. Uh, and we believe in doing that uh, through collaboration with our industry partners, having those customers at the table, uh, and having our entrepreneurs be exposed to uh, that type of insight early on in, in product development. So any opportunities we have to invite thought leaders, invite speakers, uh, to help us understand what's happening in the space, to provide a case study of what's happening, uh, we always look for, for those opportunities. So we're really uh, very happy and excited to have, have Sandy here uh, and join us today. Uh, I will uh, let him uh, provide his own background, uh, his own in, uh, information and introduction. Uh, he is a physician scientist who joined Sangamo a couple of years ago. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to hear his take on uh, how that company has grown and, and what he has been doing to, him and his team has, have been doing to uh, help grow it uh, in, in the last couple of years. Uh, last housekeeping matter, so we are uh, going to do a, Sandy's going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes, uh, share some information on the company and what they're doing. Uh, we're then going to spend about 15, 20 minutes in a fireside chat uh, format, taking questions from the audience through our online social Q&A platform. So you'll see matter.socialqa.com. We'll put that address back up uh, when we do the fireside. Uh, but please feel free to take out your phones and your tablets and, and log into that uh, and, and keep populating questions in there even throughout the, the presentation. Uh, and we'll go through as many of those as we can in the fireside chat. All right. Wonderful. With that, I will introduce Sandy McRae. Sandy, thank you so much. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Sandy, and I'm, I lead the team at Sangamo, and I, I want to talk to you about what it is we do. But I want to, have, to do this as a more general talk and talk a little about gene editing and genome editing and what it means and the implications for us and for society. So it's going to be a more general talk rather than the usual corporate pitch. This is the first time we've tried it, so it's being tested on you, so thank you very much. Um, I'm a physician. I trained for seven years as a molecular biologist, and my wife said it would never be any use to me. And then this job came up, and, and it's given us uh, great fun over the, the subsequent two years to show that I was right for once. <laughs> and then I, I, and I worked for GSK for a long time, and then Takeda in Deerfield for three years, and I lived around the corner in State and Grand. And I know this is a typical spring day in, in Chicago, and it's the only spring day in Chicago, isn't it? <laughs> yeah? So, uh, let me advance this. There we go. There we go, thank you. That helps. 
So we always have to, we're public companies, so we have to show our refer you all to our SEC filings. So this is what I'm going to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you a little about what gene and genome editing is, about our zinc finger technology and why, it's, why we think it's the best. I've already had a challenge from someone in the audience that we have to show it's the best. And the medicines that we're going to make and how we think about them and how you should think about them. Because uh, when I did this molecular biology a long time ago, in 91 to 97, uh, we were right at the forefront of it. We were um, sequencing base by base, and none of us dreamt that we'd be in a situation just 15, 20 years later where we would take that knowledge and apply it to make medicines and potentially to cure disease. And that's a bit that's a fundamental change. This isn't another drug. It isn't even a slightly better way to do something. This will fundamentally change how medicine is given and how patients are thought of and how we treat disease. And that's a bit that makes this exciting. And that's why people like you here in, in this incubator that I'm told is the future of healthcare need to think about this and prepare for this as, as the future environment. So I'm also going to show you some of the patients that we bring in to talk with us. And we feel this is really important. We bring the patients in for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, and it's both about responsibility. So the first responsibility is for the people that work with me to understand the responsibility they have to this patient. That when we do something or give something to a patient like Erica, we have a responsibility to get it right. This is something where when we do something to a patient like Erica, give her a new gene therapy or gene editing, that will last her for life. And therefore, we need to be absolutely sure that what we're doing is right. But then there's a second responsibility that's around urgency, because these patients are waiting, and we have to have an urgency to get there and to get there with the medicine. And Erica's fascinating. Erica's 35, and she was diagnosed with MPS1 just when she was 21, which is incredibly unusual. But rare diseases are rare, so doctors have rarely seen them, and so often these patients are misdiagnosed. But even in the, in the time from 21 to 35, she's had 70 operations on everything from her, from her joints to her nerves to her heart. And the burden of disease is enormous. And her disease is, is really important to her. And the reason I like Erica is she has a tattoo showing the chromosome where the mutation is for her MPS1 disease. And, and it's that combination of the human condition and the human challenge and hard science that I think defines what Sangamo is and what we're going to be in the future. But she said something else that's also important. MPS is three letters. And she's not three letters. She's Erica. And we need to understand that each one of these patients is different and needs to be treated differently. They're not just a number on a chromosome. And they're not just three letters of a syndrome. They're a patient that each has a different desire and a different way they think of their disease. And we'll come back to that later on. But first, some of you might not be molecular biologists or have, have done this since biology at school. And so just to kind of remind us all of the picture, the human genome is 3.2 billion bases, which sounds like a lot. But the working memory on my iPhone is bigger. And my iPhone can probably contain 20 human genomes. So what was a huge number in the past is now a manageable number in the world of big data. It's, it's a tractable problem. When I did my PhD, I sequenced 15,000 bases over three years. Nowadays, we can sequence a human genome in an afternoon, and it costs perhaps down to $100. And the cost, and, and, and the cost of the human genome isn't the sequencing. It's now what do you do with it, and the people that have to counsel the patient and understand what to do with it. So it's no longer about the biology. It's about the consequences of the biology. There are 20,000 genes within the human genome. So the whole beauty of humanity is controlled by just 20,000 different genes. So it's not just the gene themselves, but it's how it's expressed, how it's controlled, that defines why I look different from you. So we have very similar genes, but, and they're probably 99% similar. But we're different, and that's the beauty of this and the care that needs to be taken around the, the genome. And we're going to talk about gene editing or genome editing and gene therapy, and it's, it's a, an important difference. What we like to do, and eventually want to do definitively, is 
gene or genome editing, where we actually change the DNA. We either delete a bit of it or replace it with another piece of DNA. The current therapy that most people use is gene therapy. And in gene therapy, instead of changing your own DNA, we add an extra little bit of DNA. That it's called episomal, so it doesn't integrate. And as the cells divide, as your livers divide, and particularly we, we each change our liver every probably seven years, you kick out the, the episomal gene therapy. So it's not permanent. And that's why we like genome editing, because many of the diseases that we're studying start in childhood. And if you imagine the size of a, of a baby's liver and an adult's liver, and the number of years and liver regenerations that they have to go through, the only solution for children is to get to them as early as possible and to do gene or genome editing. And what we do, as I say, is we use zinc fingers and we, we cartoon it with the, the scissors to either make a cut in the genome, in the gene on the right to remove a bit of DNA, or we make a cut and we replace it with a new bit of DNA. It sounds sci-fi but it actually works reliably. It's, it's more like engineering than it is biology. And the understanding we have over the many years means that we can reliably do this in the test tube. And the main question that we're facing isn't, will the DNA cut? It's, can I get enough of the zinc fingers in there to make the cut? Because if I do get enough in, in a cell or in an animal, it works every time. It's not a question of can it work, should it work, it just works. It's what zinc fingers do when they meet a piece of DNA. It's just a matter of delivery, and I'm gonna come back to that later. There are other ways to edit DNA. And these are the crystal structures with zinc fingers, which is our technology, meganucleases, talons, which is another technology that Sangamo developed. And then I believe there's a thing called CRISPR. Now, God bless them. They have changed the field. Anyone can do CRISPR. It's very easy to do in a test tube. And if I was back doing my PhD and wanted to do a simple experiment in a, in a cell or even in a mouse, I probably would use CRISPR because for most things, it suffices. But our belief is it's good for experiments. It hasn't yet got to the stage where it's good to, to make a medicine. Sangamo with the zinc fingers have done, have had, five, six, seven almost things in patients. The three CRISPR companies haven't yet got anything into a patient. So there's still time to go. I hope they get there because I believe that eventually the solution is to have a variety of different techniques or technologies that will be applied appropriately to a different disease or a different patient. So they will get there and um, we wish them well. And when they get there, I want to try and set up a framework of how you think about editing because it's a complicated thing and, and we're all very competitive and we all say ours is best. And the way we're trying to frame the discussion is with precision, efficiency and specificity. And the ideal technology will manage all three of them and bring it all together. So precision is where can you target. So if you imagine this genome of, of 3.2 billion base pairs, how many of those base pairs can you recognize and make a cut? And with zinc fingers, there's nothing that constrains us. And so we can cut any nucleotide in the genome. And for about two thirds of them, we already have the appropriate zinc fingers in the cupboard. So it, the rest of them, we just need to make a bit like you make a bespoke suit for someone that's too tall or too wide. CRISPR's constrained by something called a PAM sequence, which means they can only cut, I know at the moment it's about two or 10% of the nucleotides. They will get there, but at the moment we win on precision. The next way is how well can you edit? So if you recognize a bit of DNA, how reliably in a test tube do you make the cut? And we regularly now come up to 90% efficiency, 99.5 in one legendary batch. And so we feel we can, we can efficiently make uh, cut at the right place. And then finally, it's around specificity. So once you've recognized the bit of DNA, once you've made the cut, do you cut anywhere else? Now as a physician, that's important. You want to make sure when, that when you make this edit in a patient that it only happens in one place. You don't want it to be off target. Because although the side effects you might get from your aspirin or your antihypertensive medicine are important, 
they go away the next day. The moment the drug drains from your system and you pee it out or absorb it in, or digest it in your liver, you're safe. You don't have the drug in your system. What we're doing will be with you for life, and therefore it's very important that we understand it only cuts one place and doesn't cut anywhere else. And of course we believe that CFNs are the only technology at the moment that can do all three. The more you change specificity, the less effective you become for many of the other technologies. The more you change the specificity, often you constrain the, the uh, precision. So the three pull each other in different directions. And over the 20 years, we've engineered our technology so as all three come together. So this is a zinc finger. So zinc fingers are present in all of you. They're, they are how we control the expression of our genes normally. They circulate in your body and they turn genes on and off. They wreck it, they're what, what are called alpha helices. So you can imagine the helix that looks like a helter skelter. Rec and each helix recognizes three nucleotides within the genome. They're joined to the next one by a linker and a beta pleated sheet. And a beta pleated sheet is just a fancy name for a folded bit of protein. And we store them as two zinc fingers at a time. So it's two zinc fingers, each recognizes three nucleotides out of 3.2 billion. And there's a subtlety about this that I want, I want to try and show in this slide. And we're testing this slide, so I hope, hope I can explain it well. So if you look at the one on the, light, the left, the sequence is GTA, CTA, G. And the zinc fingers ends up with zinc, uh, the, the two zinc fingers recognize it, and the code below is what the zinc fingers are called in our library. If you move the zinc fingers just one to the right, you can see that the zinc finger themselves are completely different. So but just by moving one nucleotide, it doesn't mean they're one nucleotide different, they are completely different zinc fingers. And McDavid, who, who um, is, is our communications expert, tries to tell me these are homonyms. So like the word whole and the word holds just moves one along, but has a completely different definition. And, and so we think of it as, as a way of, just by moving one either way, we get a whole new sense of efficiency and specificity to, to the zinc finger. So when you send me a sequence of the gene that you want edited, we clunk together like Lego, we push them together like Lego, and within eight to 10 days, we can come up with a zinc, I call them a zinc hand, which is usually about um, six, six zinc fingers long, and we use a couple of them to make a cut. So six, that's 18 plus 18 is 36 base pairs, which means it's a unique sequence in the genome. 30, a, a string of 36 nucleotides only happens once in the genome. So immediately we get a specificity that is not available to the competition. And then it sticks to the DNA. Now, on the left here, you can see a zinc finger binding into the DNA. And what we discovered was the zinc finger was binding non-specifically. And, and you see the positive charges. Some amino acids are, are charged and others are neutral. And we discovered that there were positive charged ones on the arginine on the left-hand side and they were sticking non-specifically to the, to the DNA. And when we got rid of that, the non-specific binding and the off-target completely disappeared from our zinc finger. And this is stuff we're gonna publish this year that is, we've been working on for about two years that completely changes our off-target and makes us unique in no longer having off-target cutting. So over the past uh, couple of years, what we've done is we've improved the whole zinc finger set up, and this is, this is an example of a working set of zinc fingers. So you can see it's two sets of hands um, with six, each one having six alpha helixes, the zinc fingers, and when they come together, and if, if, you, if you recognize a piece of DNA, they come together, in the middle of them, there is a, a FOC nucleus that comes together and only works when the two bits come together. And, and what a FOC nucleus is, is it's an enzyme that cuts DNA. So we, we get the recognition from the zinc fingers, which means they only land at this place, and when the two bits of the enzyme come together, it makes a cut there. And by designing the way they're all joined together and getting rid of these positively charged, we can do this efficiency, precision, and specificity. 
And when you give me that sequence that you want me to cut at, this is what it looks like. So if you imagine this, this G down there is where you want to make the cut. Within eight or 10 days, what we'll do is we'll give you 100 different options by clunking together different bits of Lego, by sometimes making it whole and sometimes making it whole. And we'll give you a series of options on the way to cut the, cut the DNA. In contrast, uh, CRISPR can only cut twice. And if these are good, they're good. If they're not good, you have a problem. So we believe what, what our technology does is allows you to choose and to choose the best way to cut the DNA. And you end up with, with a, a plot that looks like this that shows every, every nucleotide that you could have cut and how efficiently you could cut it. And this is on the first pass. So there are ones that we can't cut. And those are the ones for the tall person or the fat person where we had to make a suit specifically for them. And we can do that, but it maybe takes three months as opposed to the orange bars, which takes eight to 10 days. And this is the one data slide I want to show you about off target. So what we're looking at here is the efficiency of cutting at the right place. And it's between 82 and 85%. It's good, these are, these are good assets. And this is what the, it was cutting elsewhere at a frequency of 28% until we removed those positively charged residues. And now the off target has disappeared. So we've solved off target cutting, which is important because from a patient's point of view, you don't want to cut elsewhere. You want to be able to say, I can cut wherever I want and nowhere else. And we feel we've solved for that now. And that's why we, we feel we have precision efficiency and specificity. So let's then use this technology and move it into medicines. And when, when, I, when I took over in Sangamo two years ago, it was called Sangamo Biosciences. And to me, that meant we were a technology company and we weren't a medicine company. And we changed the name to Sangamo Therapeutics. And that was to send the medicine internally and externally that we cared about medicines and we wanted to move through to patients. And for those of you who are starting up companies or naming is really important and also establishing a culture that everyone can hold on to and a belief system that they can hold on to is almost more important than what you're doing it, 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 you have to bring the company together and we spent a lot of time on on our mission statement or vision which is to translating groundbreaking signs into genomic therapies that transform patients lives and i can unpack that phrase we believe it's groundbreaking science, and we will only do groundbreaking science. We'll only do things that are fundamental and important and move the field forward. But we'll only do them if we're translating them into medicines. So we're not here to do a fancy paper. We're here to do a piece of science that gets into a patient. And we'll only do it for things where we'll transform patients' lives. So this is an important technology, and we, nobody knows what's going to happen. We believe it's safe and the agencies believe they're safe and the doctors we work with believe it's safe. But until we've proven that, it is prudent that we only do it in transformative diseases. So patients that might die if, they're, if they don't get a therapy or for whom the alternative therapies are not addressing what it is that they need. So it's inappropriate to use this for hypertension, but it would be appropriate for oncology or for some of the rare hereditary diseases that the, that the kids might die from. If we can get the support of the community, the patients, the families, the doctors, and everyone behind us, that this is an important problem that we have to address. And we do it through a variety of technologies, and we have a wonderful pipeline. So we have five things in the clinic at the moment. We, ha we will have, in the next 18 months, seven different readouts of clinical studies. Now, within the biotech community, I don't know if, if any of you worked in, a, in companies like ours, usually you have one or two things that you're working on. And the bit that says, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna show you how the sausages are made. The bit that says undisclosed targets usually means you haven't even disclosed it within the company. It's things that you're hoping will eventually happen. For a company this size to have seven different things coming in the next 18 months is, is an enormous responsibility. And it really will be defining on, on gene editing moving forward into the world. 
And we can't do it ourselves. And we do it in partnership with many large pharma companies. And having been come from GSK and Takeda, I believe that pharma companies are, the, are one of the best places to make medicines when the medicine is complicated or competitive. And so we've chosen very carefully to partner with the best in the field for certain diseases. So we at Sangamo will take forward uh, the inherited metabolic diseases, we'll take forward some of the CNS diseases, particularly tylopathy, which is for Alzheimer's, and we will take forward autoimmunity, so that's where the body reacts against itself and things like MS, diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis. But for diseases such as oncology, we partnered with Gilead. For diseases such as haemophilia, we partnered with Pfizer. Um, for thalassemia and sickle with bioverative that is now Sanofi. And those were strategic decisions. And as the CEO, one of the most important things I have to decide is, what do we keep ourselves and what do we partner with other people? And it sounds um, like a, a, a minor decision, but the value of the company seems to be predicated on uh, uh, giving people a sense that you've got, some, you've got a pipeline of your own, you're taking it forward, you'll take it to commercialization, because that gives investors something to believe in. Whereas with partnerships, they feel you've given away part of your technology. Now, our challenge is there's 20,000 genes, so we cannot do all of them. And if people come to us with a good proposal for an important gene and an important medical condition, we'll find a way to partner with them and work with them. But we have to take things forward ourselves. And that balance is, is an interesting one within the company. Because as soon as you take things forward yourself, you have to invest all of your resources, all of your people to make those successful. And the balance between that and doing business development is always an interesting one. Because business development is cool and sexy and everyone wants to do it but it may not be right for the company. So Sangamo has been in this business for a long time and um, we were the first company to do in vitro gene editing and that's where we take cells out of your body, we edit them and we give them back. And you'll have heard of this as the CAR T cells, the CAR T story, which is the thing that is going to be revolutionized treatment of oncology. Well, Sangamo already had done this um, 2008 where we took patients with HIV we took out their T cells, and there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a mutation you can make in T cells that makes them resistant to HIV. It was found by chance in a patient in Berlin who got a bone marrow transplant and suddenly his HIV was cured. And so we can replicate that with our editing technology. And we did it, and there's now 104 patients that have been treated with this. Have they, do they still have HIV? Yes. And the reason for that is that we understood the technology and were able to apply the technology wisely, but we didn't completely understand the biology. And that's the second challenge I have in this company, is we need to tease apart what is a technology risk, does the editing work, and what is a biology risk, do I understand what I'm applying the editing to? And most of pharma is a biology risk. You know, is, is a certain receptor involved in schizophrenia? Does a certain cell system cause your hypertension? And that's not always understood. And that's why drugs fail regularly in, in pharma companies and biotech companies. Whereas what we're doing, we believe now, is engineering and it's technology and, and we can make it work. So we need to be, be careful to decide when it's a technology risk and when it's a biology risk. And we did the first in vitro gene editing, and now we've done, last year, we did the first ever in vivo gene editing. With This is a, a man called Brian who um, has MPS2. And, what, and I'll, show you, I'll tell you how it is that we treat him and we, we do it in vivo. So we give him something and the editing happens in his body. And he's a remarkable man. He's, he's in his 40s, and, and he said he realized that what he was doing wasn't just about him, but was about the whole community. By being the first person to do this, he was blazing the trail so as the children that really are the ones that we all want to treat will get this treatment. And, and it's, it's a remarkable statement of his, his personal mission, but it, but it also talks about in rare diseases how important the patient community is and how working with them and getting their support and belief is vital to our success. We've been here for 20 two years and everyone says so why haven't you done anything yet but I want to put this in perspective with with a timeline for DNA so if you start back at Watson's and Crick and 
and of course we put Franklin in there as well, um, way back in 1950. So it's only 60, 70 years that anyone's known anything really about DNA. And if you imagine that um, Sangam was founded in 1995 and the human genome wasn't sequenced till 2000, but then you can see the pace um, picking up. And a lot of the reason it's easier to do it now is because it's much easier to sequence. It's the bioinformatic platform that allows you to analyze DNA is easier. Computing's easier, vectors are easier. So the whole, plat the whole world is easier now. And CRISPR and, and our friends and those companies have, have made our life easier as well because the world knows about gene editing and believes in it. And so now it's a, it's a thoughtful race to, to move forward in, in this much more facilitated world. So I'm going to talk a little about our, our program. So the first one is genome editing. So instead of editing, us, editing, correcting the mutation in the gene, what we do is we put a new copy of it in the patient's liver. Livers are easy to get to. It's the only place at the moment that people can reliably get the, the gene editing to. And what we do is we, we, you can recognize now the scissors of the zinc fingers, and we add in a new copy of the gene that the patient's missing. We, in, we infuse it into the patient. It takes a couple of hours. It goes to the liver. It recognizes the albumin gene. Albumin's a protein that circulates in your blood in, in great abundance. Um, we make a double-stranded break. The transgene gets stitched back in permanently, and the albumin promoter starts producing this. And then the patient has got their own factory of albumin being poured out of their, out of their liver. So this is what Brian has had, and very soon, in later summer, we will um, know the success of this. And eventually, we hope to get into children, because AJ and Aidan are more typical of the patients that, that need this. And they need it from the very earliest moment. And so the soon, they get diagnosed usually about two, one, three. And so treating it at that age is the right place to go. But you've got to do this prudently. You've got to start in adults and work gradually back as you gain safety information. The CAR-T uh, excitement around oncology has led to companies being bought for billions of dollars because everyone's so excited about using cellular therapy that recognizes something about the cancer that you can take out a, a cell, give it back to the patient, and attack, and attack their cancer. And there's been remarkable cure rates of 60 70% cure rates, incredible results. And this axicaptagene siloleuc Kel is, is from our friends at Kite, who we now partner with um, for, for um, cellular therapy. But this is, this is current day, and we want to take it to the future. So in the current day, what happens is if you have a cancer, we take your cells out, we edit them, and we give them back to you. So you get your own personal cells back to you. And there's several issues with that. The first is it's expensive because we're doing something just for you. The second is you're probably sick and you're in a hurry to get the, the cells back to you. And about a third of the patients die in the time it takes me to take them out, edit them, and give them back. And then the third thing is uh, because you're sick, your cells aren't probably very good, and it would be much better to have a healthier, young version of the cells. So the way forward is called allogeneic. And what you do is you take your cells, because you're young, and we edit your cells when we, before you have, anyone has cancer, we do all this editing. We knock out all the bits that make your cells about you, and we change them to versions that just make them generic, that it would be safe to give to any of you, rather than specifically for you and your cancer. And then we end up with lots of vials of, of potential cells, so as when you do become unwell, I hope you don't, but if you do become unwell, we can give you some of her cells that are now anonymized and are ready to go and are sitting on the shelf. And the advantages of that are her cells are healthy. She hasn't had any chemotherapy. Her cells are cheap because we've been able to make them in large amounts. And her cells are ready. So the moment that you need it, we can give you the allogeneic T cells. And this is all ready to go. Now, to do this, you need to do it efficiently. And it's lots of changes you're making in the cell. And uh, when we did the deal with Gilead, um, they looked at all the different technologies and they decided zinc fingers was by far the optimal way to do the editing. We actually edited four different things in the cell. So we took out a T cell and we changed four different genes. 
which if you took me back to my PhD, the idea of changing four genes and then giving it back to someone, it's science fiction. I mean, it really is incredible uh, high-end science. And we can do four, we can knock out the T-cell receptor, which is in, in immunity, the, the HLA, which defines you as who you are in yourself. SISH is one of these uh, checkpoint inhibitors the, that is important for oncology. And then we can put in something that targets it to the specific cancer. And we can do it in 70, so 76% of cells have all of those. And this is the maths, because some of you I'm sure are business people, that shows why it's important to do it at high efficiency. We get up at 90 to 99% efficient. So it means that if you do compound interest, the majority of cells will have what we want. Selectus and some of our competitors do it at 50%. If you're only doing one edit, it's probably okay. But if you're doing lots of editing, the compound interest quickly ends up that the, only the minority of your cells have what it is you're looking for. Shifting again to gene regulation, this is going back to what the original requirement of, um, the original role in your body of, of zinc fingers are, is to turn genes on and off. And what they do is they recognize, you can, I know you're all zinc finger experts by now, you can recognize the alpha helices, but instead of putting an enzyme that cuts, what you do is put an activator or a repressor at the end that recognizes the control sequence of the gene and turns it off. And we're using this to target diseases in the brain because the brain doesn't, doesn't uh, um, replicate often and therefore it's not so good at getting cut, it's much better at being turned on and off. And we can either do this intravenous, which is what everyone wants to do, intrathecal, where you do it into the cerebral spinal fluid, a bit like a, a, a pregnant woman would get as an epidural, or for significant diseases, you can actually just inject it into the brain. And that becomes the benefit-risk discussion. It's only appropriate to put things in people's brain if it's a really important disease. So diseases like Huntington's, where the patient will die very soon from their disease, it may be appropriate to, direct it, to inject it directly in. For something like Alzheimer's, where you have to treat early, many pe people won't get the disease, they just are at risk for it. it. I feel it wouldn't be appropriate to do that, but it would be appropriate to give it intravenously. And tau is what we're targeting, and many other companies are trying to develop things for tau, and they're doing antibodies, but the problem with tau is there's so many var various forms of it that we feel the only important, the only sensible way to do is to go right back to the source and turn off the gene. And that's why we're targeting tau with, with the repressor. I want to show you one other bit of science, which is very, very cool. Um, there are a series of diseases in, in the... Um, particularly in the brain, Huntington's one, ALS, such as uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, you call it in America, is another where the cause of the gene, the cause of the disease is the expansion of a part of the DNA. So you can see this is, this is for uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. So the, the, there's this sequence, GGGGCC, so four Gs and two Cs. And in a normal person, you might, you might get um, two to 30 copies of this. DNA doesn't deal very well with repeat sequence and what it tends to do is slip and give you another sequence. So you end up with two to 30 sequences of this. When patients have a version of Lou Gehrig's or if they have Huntington's, what happens is this expands and you can see in, in the Lou Gehrig version, it's up to 100 times, 100 versions of this and this causes the disease. So what we're going to, do, what we can do with the zinc fingers is we can land specifically on the mutated allele. You have two copies of every gene in your body, and we can leave the normal one untouched. And you can see this over here. So um, this is uh, in a normal person, and what we do with the with the zinc fingers is we repress the bad one, and we leave the normal one untouched. And there's no other technology can do that. It's it's remarkable that you can leave the wild type allele working, and you can turn off the one that's causing the disease. And you know, Stephen Hawking is said to have had uh, uh, motor neuron disease or Lou Gehrig's disease. He lived for far too long, uh, in my impression, to suggest that it was a common or garden version of it. There was something strange about it. But eventually, diseases like his 
will be sequenced and understood and will be susceptible, I believe, to uh, genomic and genetic solutions. And then the last kind of thing we do is, is, is bog standard gene therapy. And you might ask why we're doing that when we say genome editing is the thing to do. Uh, running a company, you have to choose risk. And we felt that the, what we were doing was such cutting edge that having some bankers of things that we knew would work was a sensible, prudent way to build a company. And so we decided that we would do traditional gene therapy. And it's easy now to do traditional gene therapy. There's, there are several companies studying several diseases, and haemophilia is one that is um, most used. I'm going to use a, as, as a model for the final bit of my talk. And what you do is you package the, the new copy of the gene into vectors, you give it to the patient, and it, it exists episomally, so it doesn't go into the chromosome, it exists within the cell and produces it. And as long as the disease you're trying to treat is for adults, it's fine, because the, cell, the, the liver will turn over over several years and the, the gene will continue to be um, transcribed. And there's a couple of companies that are already in the clinic with this and have shown results that suggest that the patients can stop taking the factor for haemophilia. And why is that important? So um, this, this young man does bodybuilding and he goes through millions of dollars of factor. We had a couple of, of young men come in. And, and with gene therapy, he would no longer need to get uh, factor eight injection on a regular basis. The average cost of a haemophilia patient is $6.5 million. So they take $6.5 million of factor in their life. What that doesn't then allow for is, and they then go into hospital because they have bleeds or they have um, bleeds into their joints, and what's the cost of that? And then they then lose time at work or their parents lose time at work so the total cost is much greater than 6.5. So thinking how we price this and how we think about value to society will be very important. At the same time as Matt came, two other young men came. And one was, was uh, I'm going to get this wrong, he, no, he's the water polo player. The other one was the weightlifter. So the other one was a weightlifter. And he took $3.2 million of factor each year. So each year he injected himself with $3.2 million that your insurance paid for. So Blue Cross Blue Shield pays for his, his factor because he's a haemophiliac and that's the right thing to do. But it's enormously expensive. And something like gene therapy could avoid this young man ever having to have treatment. And what was interesting was their, their parents were there for these two young men. And the parents told stories about Yes, it's fine now that he's an adult, he can inject himself, and he, the, the haemophiliacs do a fantastic job of looking after themselves. But she said, you imagine with a one-year-old or a two-year-old that's bouncing about and you're trying to hold them down and get intravenous access to give them uh, their factor, how difficult that is and how important having a solution that is for life would be to them. But the one I wanted, the last patient I wanted to talk about with haemophilia, was the other young man who said, I don't want you to edit my genes. I'm a haemophiliac. I don't have haemophilia. I'm a haemophiliac. He had lived with it all his life. He had learned how to treat it. He felt in control of his life, and he didn't want someone to come in and change his DNA and change who he was. And I think that's an important statement. And I, and I think patients with haemophilia who look completely normal and with treatment with factor can live a normal life. That's an understandable and probably appropriate statement for some of them to make. I don't feel it's as understandable if it's for a disease that you will die from. But if it's a disease you don't, I think it has to be a personal choice about what you take and how you take it and whether you have a treatment for life or not. And then there's the question that I think we're only just beginning to think of is if you treat this man and you edit his gene, and he no longer has haemophilia. Does he no longer have haemophilia? Is he an ex-haemophiliac? Is he a haemophiliac with a gene edited? How do you describe him? What are his rights? What are his insurance premiums now that you've changed his DNA? And, and these questions need to be answered so as we can all come together and properly use gene editing and gene therapy in society. And I, I, But I want to give you some comfort finally um, about the number of layers of protection there is so that we do the right thing. 
Within the biotech world, there are so many layers to make sure that only the right patient gets the right gene editing or gene therapy. Of course, the patient has to consent. The problem that, or the challenge there is to, is to frame it in the way that the patient really understands what it is that, that's happening to them. When you all consent for your hernia operation, you, you barely understand what it is that the, the doctor's telling you. I know I don't. You barely understand what risk it is when you take a medicine. Try translating that so as you're now going to tell them about um, something that is a bit of DNA that will be with them for life. That's a difficult thing to do. But there are, the hospitals protect them with an institutional review board that makes sure that the hospital believes in it. The NIH ensures that we do this in public and transparent so as they can review it. The FDA um, reviews everything we do and they do a fantastic job. And I was asked earlier about the FDA because they, they get a bad rap. Um, and sometimes they're, pr they're protecting patients maybe a little too much. I would say in this they've been fantastic partners. They want to help move this forward. And we have really good positive discussions with them. And then even within the in industry group, so I sit on the board of bio, and on bio we have discussions about this often, and we all agree we'll only do somatic cell editing, and we all agree what's appropriate to do now and not to do, and, and we, we try and tell a story to society. But then the final one is we'll have to do long-term follow-up. The one treatment that was um, <coughs> recently approved, the FDA requires 15 years of follow-up for, for those patients. My feeling is it's probably got to be longer. I think it should be for life. Um, I don't believe that what we're doing causes harm to patients or I wouldn't do it. I believe the benefit risk is correct. But these patients are going to go on for the rest of their life and they will have events that are important that we need to be able to put into perspective. And the only way to do that is through collecting data and understanding whether this is unusual compared to the other patients that had the same procedure. But I, my last slide is Noah. Noah is, I think he's three now, and his parents came and visited us with Noah. And Noah did, you know, like the three-year-old thing, climbing on the photocopier and charming the secretaries, and everyone loves him. And the parents told about um, uh, the moment that they got called about the diagnosis and, and how all of a sudden their life changed. And they went from having a normal, healthy one-year-old to then having a child that they knew would have a shortened life expectancy and that would be uh, have, have the treatment uh, forever to try and um, abrogate the, the consequences of disease. And so for them, they want us urgently to get there and they want us to come up with solutions. We have to do it well and we have to do it prudently, but I think the future is, is almost upon us. So I'll stop and answer any questions that you want to ask. That was great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> really, really interesting information. I, we have you know, about 15 minutes just to take some Q&A uh, from the audience. Uh, and I wanted to maybe just start uh, and ask to, if we, if we zoom out for one second and start with something that you started your presentation with, which was uh, every patient is different. It's about these, it's about these patients. Um, I'm curious. What has been the feedback from some patients sort of against this approach, uh, against a gene editing approach? You touched on it a little bit towards the end of your, your talk there. Uh, but what has been the, the uh, perception or how well has, have physicians and patients really embraced uh, the idea of, of a technology that fundamentally changes their, their DNA? Um, I... We haven't, we haven't had much pushback. Um, they're fascinated by it. They see a chance to get rid of their disease. I think it's always easy to stand here and have an opinion on whether this is the right thing or to do or not. And we so seldom ask the patient themselves, what do you want? What risk do you want to take? 
how, how, do, you, how do you feel about your, your disease? Um, and so consent and, as I said, the support of the patient community is, is vital. For the MPS community, we work with them regularly and they have blogs and safe spaces they can all go and talk to. And they talk regularly about gene editing and gene therapy. And we go to conferences where you'll be talking and half the audience will be investors and then there'll be some investigators and then there'll be all these kids in wheelchairs and their parents. And they are remarkably educated in, in what's happening and what the opportunities are. And so I think they truly make informed choices. There's something about being first in anything. So the first patient in any of the trials is always harder to get in. And that's why what Brian did was, was remarkable. Because once he did it, it opened a cascade of patients that were more happy to, to do it. So um, it will become part of the normal armamentarium in medicine. It's just a matter of time. Can you elaborate a little bit on, uh, you talked about, you shared some timelines in there um, about the time it takes to almost customize these zinc fingers for each patient. Uh, can you share a little bit more about the front end of that process? What, yeah, what so goes it, so it takes, it takes um, we, we did a really poor job of telling the world this. It takes 10 days, eight days if you work over the weekend, as I tell my staff. It takes 10 days to make a set of zinc fingers. And within 10 days, you'll know whether you, you have, you've got a solution. Um, mostly, we can come up with a solution um, off the shelf. And that period of tuning it and understanding it maybe takes two or three months, which is probably the same as it takes to tune and understand or to understand CRISPR. The bit that isn't understood is then the period between that and filing an IND is is the majority of the drug development process. And things like a three month safety study traditionally take three months. And, and so there's nothing you can do to speed that. And the, the process of creating an IND is about organizational efficiency. And then the process of clinical development is about collecting enough safety and efficacy data. So the the time and the and the efficiency of actually making the asset in the first bit is only a tiny bit of the whole um, arc of making these into medicines. As you think about um, uh, one one of the challenges uh, that I remember with gene therapy was uh, delivery uh, and and actually delivering what you need to deliver to the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about what zinc fingers can do that's different that can address some of the delivery challenges? So, as with all the other technologies, zinc fingers need to be delivered. So it's not that we change it. Now, we're smaller than CRISPR, so we're about 1.6 KB for each zinc hand, so we can be more easily packaged. Um, but the technologies that deliver are the same. So it's either using AAV, uh, adeno-associated virus, or it's using uh, lipid nanoparticles at the moment. So it's a kind of ball of fat that you wrap whatever you're trying to deliver up into. At the moment, you can deliver reliably into the liver. You can deliver into the eye because you can inject directly into the eye. And we're right at the cusp of being able to deliver into the brain. And I see that as the most important next step. Once we get those vectors that can take you into the brain, there's a whole slew of diseases. There's a whole slew, I mean, it could be um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, motor neuron disease, and then a whole range of rare monogenic diseases in the brain that could easily be addressed with this technology. And they are high-end medical need. So they, uh, they, um, they uh, satisfy that benefit-risk type equation. They're also things that you need to get in early so as the patient doesn't suffer the consequences. So they're ideal targets for us to be going after. Interesting question that came through is, uh, how do you deal with the fact that there are only a limited number of monogenic diseases? Yeah, but they add up. They add up. That's the thing. So I, I'm sure I should know this number, but it's some. It's tens of millions of patients in the U.S. have monogenic have have rare diseases. So all the rare diseases, if you add them all up, make a lot of a lot of patients. So. There are a number of companies that have made a very successful living out of rare diseases and monogenic diseases. I would think of Shire, Biomarin, Ultragenics as, as those. 
But we don't feel we want to be limited to that. So I think there are monogenic rare diseases. Then there's common diseases, Alzheimer's, one of them, that could be addressed by a genetic approach. And eventually there'll be polygenic diseases for which you could, ad you could address several of the levers that are um, genetic or genomic. We don't think all disease will be addressed in this, this way. There'll be diseases that will always be better treated with small molecules or antibodies. But um, the number of patients that could benefit from a genetic approach, I think, is enormous. Uh, interesting question that came through is, why has why CRISPR received so much attention, whereas zinc fingers have not, despite the advantage in terms of the number of clinical trials? So we look in CRISPR as like the boy band, and we're the Rolling Stones. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know... The boy bands have to have the froth and the excitement about them, and, and the technology is, is, is exciting. And they got funded incredibly richly by a series of, uh, of investors, and uh, everyone's excited about it. And the other bit about CRISPR is you can, you can do it in your garage. You can literally go to courses uh, where any one of us could go and learn how to do CRISPR. And as I said, if I was doing my PhD again, I would use CRISPR. So it feels easy. There are many people doing it. It's, it, it's, it's an interesting business discussion about open sourcing like CRISPR is versus a company like ours that has all the IP. So you may have heard that the CRISPR companies don't know who's got the IP and each one says they've got it. Now that will be solved. There'll be a deal done between them and they'll license it to each other and to everyone else. But that will reduce the value of what they do. On the other hand, my predecessor did a fantastic job of collecting IP, and we have all of it. So we are the only people that can really do this. And that's fine if we can move it forward into the clinic. So the thing, reason the board brought me in instead of him was to bring someone with more clinical experience so as we can drive it forward. We do have to tell a story against um, the music of the boy bands and the excitement that everyone knows about them when I, you know, when your taxi driver says, is that CRISPR? You know that, you know that they, it, it's managed to get into everyone's head, which is, a, which is a remarkable moment for society because a, a high-end technology is understood by my mother's had read it. So, so we need to keep telling a story and we need to tell a story based on data. And when we show the first clinical results, I think that will persuade everyone that what we have is is really remarkable. So a bit of a follow-on to that point, you talked a, a lot about the partnerships mm -hmm. that you've developed. Uh, pharma is also being challenged quite a bit these days to show longitudinal patient outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's not good enough just to have a new mechanism of action or a new NME. Uh, help us understand a little bit about the conversations that you've had with pharma, with with the payer community, with others who have uh, really pushed this issue of how do you demonstrate that longitudinal uh, outcome? Uh, what are they What are they asking for? What are they looking for? Uh, what have been some of those conversations like? That's a very good It's a very good question because um, it used to be all you needed to do was get approval at the FDA or the EMA, and then you launch your drug at whatever price. And now, increasingly almost entirely, the, the fourth hurdle is, is that the, it's not just safe and effective and approved, but it is also reimbursed. So there's, there's no point in doing something sparkly signs that lowers blood sugar if there are non-sparkly signs, old-fashioned drugs that also lower the blood sugar by just as much. And um, in my time at Takeda, we, we made difficult decisions realizing that medicines aren't just about the science, but it's about the benefit they bring to patients. Um, if you'd asked us two or three years ago, um, the pharma companies were struggling to understand where gene editing, gene therapy came into their world. And now what they're waking up to is it could eat their lunch, and they have to do this. So if you're one of the um, enzyme replacement companies and you look at a company like ours that may come up with a solution that would treat every patient and no one would need enzyme replacement, that's a really important thing to get your head around. Now, it changes the model because you have your incident and prevalent population. The, the model in pharma is that 
you treat the patient and you, you, per, you, you encourage them to stay with you so as you can, they continue to, to be treated with your meds and they take it every day or every week. And you persuade people that are on the competitor drug to change because your drug is better, safer, has less side effects. This model is different because once the patient, if it succeeds, once the patient is treated, they're treated. They no longer need to get any other form of therapy. Now, I imagine they'll need to be checked regularly by a doctor, but they no need a, they're not there to be switched to another competitor. And therefore, the, the value to society is enormous. The payers will need to think about that and how they reimburse this kind of treatment. And you will first treat the incident population, all the patients that are living at the moment with the disease, and then you'll switch to treating the prevalent population, the new patients that are born and created. And the business model for that is different. How have you, uh, this, is a, this is a challenging question, but how have you reconciled that story uh, in the current environment where there is a lot of questions around drug pricing and maybe drug overpricing? And how have you been thinking about, from a pricing perspective, uh, telling that story in, in the kind of environment that we're in? We don't talk about pricing, we talk about value. Because I don't think it's about money, it's about the difference you would make to a person's life. You imagine that picture of Noah, and if you could treat him, and he would no longer have the disease, so that he would make the enzyme for the rest of his days, and he wouldn't grow up in a wheelchair, and he wouldn't um, succumb to the, the consequences of the disease. That's a value story, and, and payers are, are interested in value. And if you could demonstrate that you've done this, and it's easy to demonstrate, or it will be easy, I would imagine, to demonstrate that you've successfully edited, the enzyme's being produced, we will gradually have to confirm that the, the benefits happen to the patient, and that's our responsibility to do that. But once you can do that, you're, you're not having a discussion about price, you're having a discussion about value. And we have had interesting discussions in the US and in Europe. And in Europe, it's sometimes easier, ironically, because in Europe, the, the health authorities look after the whole of the patient's life. So they look after their drug treatment, their hospitalization, the social consequences of this patient, the, you know, the wheelchairs, the um, keeping them in the hospital. Whereas in America, you can have different people looking after it and that the, the patient may move from provider to provider. So it isn't a lifetime care. When it's a lifetime discussion, it becomes obvious and it's all about value. When it's a transaction financially, we, it will be a more complicated discussion. Just switching gears slightly, uh, we've, you know, here at Matter, we have a number of conversations with our pharmaceutical and med tech partners, especially on the role of digital health and digital technologies and the role that that is playing in drug discovery, drug optimization, clinical trials. Uh, curious if you can share a little bit, uh, you mentioned Sangamo started back in the 90s. Uh, to the extent that these digital tools are playing a role in this gene editing technology, uh, ways in which new, uh, whether it's software technology, simulation technologies, what role that's playing uh, and how much has this gene editing technology benefited, uh, if at all, from, from any of those digital uh, um, approaches? Now you're pushing way beyond my ken. But we, do have, we have a bioinformatics group because when you send us a sequence that you want edited, um, we have a series of very complicated algorithms that would say what, where the best place to do the editing is and can choose the best set of zinc fingers to use. So it is done by computer and it, that wasn't available 20 years ago. So it's much easier to do now. Uh, one question that came in, what's the competitive advantage of allogeneic T cells made by zinc fingers uh, versus those by fate therapeutics pluripotent stem cells? If you can speak to oh, that. Oh, that's a hardcore question. Um, um, neither of them are in the clinic yet. Until they're in the clinic, we won't be able to see the advantage. The advantage from the preclinical work is ours are easy to make and they are healthy people's allogeneic T cells and the cost of goods will be cheap. Fate is a, is a fascinating company. They take, they take stem, stem cells and persuade them by potions to try and become more um, 
differentiated into T cells or whatever. That's a long way away from the clinic. Just the last couple questions as we wrap up. Uh, one on a bit of a personal note. So as an MD, PhD, how did you decide to pursue a career in the biotech industry? Um, my wife said to me, you've, you've, you've walked to the end of a branch. You're in this kind of, I was working on the puffer fish. And you know, don't ask me why. Actually, the I'll tell you why. The pufferfish has got this, a very small genome, so it's very easy to work with in sequence. Um, um, and so I, I, had, I had moved my career to a place where I hadn't thought of what was next. And I, I started to come back into academic medicine. And um, someone called me about industry. And I went to SmithKline Beecham in 1997, which then became GSK. And I'm so pleased I did it, because you can make a difference to so many more patients in, in the biotech industry than you ever do even counting up all the diabetic patients I would have seen in the past 20 years. Hundreds, thousands, if this succeeds, what we're trying to do, it's millions of pa patients that will make a difference. Uh, one of the things we're continually thinking about, especially in our community here, is the interactions between startups and pharma, uh, pharma and universities. Uh, curious, based on your background, and you mentioned you were from Chicago before, you're mm -hmm. familiar with our community here. Uh, what are some of the things that we, uh, as a community, could also be doing better to increase those interactions between those entities? How do we better work together to foster more uh, translation of more technologies forward? Um, that's, that's an important question. I, I used to do business development for, for GSK, um, and th the, it's essential. The, the ecosystem of academia and biotech and pharma all needs to work together, and academics can test the boundaries of what we do, but they really cannot move things forward. And biotech, I see, is the best way to translate between academia and moving things to become medicine-like. And then pharma, uh, it's, it's unappreciated, but sometimes you just need to do that year-long study. And the only people, I think, that can do those kind of mega studies are big companies. And so I think each group has their place. Understanding each other, places like this are, are cool. I, I was speaking to the CEO of Matter here, and he was telling me that it isn't just entrepreneurs and startups, but it was also AbbVie and Baxter and perhaps even Takeda that come here. And I think that that interaction between them is healthy because when I was in business development for a large company, the thing that drove us crazy is you would have someone pitching what could have been a good idea that hadn't thought about the, the end game and where it was going and what toxicology would be needed or what the patient would want and what was a target product profile. So I think those things and the reality of where we are and pairs is important for all of us to know. So with that, I, you know, this is a, obviously a very interesting space. I think uh, we're also very interested to see what happens a little bit on the commercial side from a, from a business model standpoint. How does this scale? How does this grow? Uh, but from a needs perspective, if this starts to fill an unmet need for a lot of those rare diseases, uh, this can be a really powerful technology. So uh, wish you and the team all the best, and we'd love to have you back here in a few years and hear the update of how things are going. Thank you. Uh, but join me in thanking Dr. McRae. <laughs>